Good evening. For those I haven't had the pleasure of meeting, my name is Mike Moe. On behalf of my colleagues at GSV and our partners at Arizona State University, I want to welcome you to the 8th Annual ASU GSV Summit. We're delighted to have you here for the next few days. We're very excited about the program that we have for you. And since it's an education and talent event, we thought the perfect place to start would be Chemistry 101. So you all remember the periodic table, right? 118 elements, very different, distinct. But when you connect them, amazing things happen. So two hydrogens and an oxygen, you get water, you get sodium, and you get chlorine, you get salt. So we got kind of our own little periodic table working at the summit. So there's 300, excuse me, there's over 3,500 people at this event over the next three days coming from over 40 countries, 70, over 70 from China alone. And so one of the things that makes this event so special is the diverse backgrounds, geographies, and so forth, all coming together with a shared passion of accelerating innovation and education and talent. So this is really about connecting people. And when you see the type of people that come here, it's educators, it's venture capitalists, it's policy makers, technology leaders, business leaders, philanthropists, entrepreneurs all colliding together, creating huge impact and network effects. Steve Jobs said the Macintosh turned out so well because the people working on it were musicians, artists, poets, and historians, who also happen to be excellent computer scientists. And we think that diversity really is some of the secret to what makes this all work. So this event is not only about connecting people, it's about connecting dots. And with all the news and the noise that's out there, it's what I call infobesity. That's what we're suffering from. So it's really hard to even spot the, you know, to, to connect us, you first need to spot them. Just for your reference, there's actually 12 different spots here. So the spots that we see in the world today include virtual reality, machine learning, artificial intelligence, globalization, Trump, Brexit, cloud computing. These are all different dots that we see, and what we're trying to do is connect these dots to recognize patterns to give us a perspective of where we think the world is heading and why. And that's what we like to try to share to, to, to benefit us all. So the first fundamental of innovation is about, you've got to think differently, right? And so on your seats, you all got a sheet with these nine dots. I'd like you to take a pen out. And I'd like you to connect these nine dots without lifting your pen off the paper. So you get four lines to connect these dots. I'll give you a few seconds to do it. Look, I'm not gonna answer, I'm not gonna answer who, ask who, who figured this out. It's usually about one out of 50 get it right, and it's almost always an entrepreneur, but this is how you do it. So obviously you gotta go outside the boundaries to make it happen. So now if I asked you to do it with three lines, because you've now been able to see that occur, many of you would be able to, be able to do this. It looks like this, right? So that's you know, critical. So an example of connecting dots and thinking outside the box is when Bob Dylan recently received the Nobel Prize in Literature. The New York Times said this would redefine the boundaries of literature. Bob Dylan said, some people feel the rain, others just get wet. He also said, colleges are like old age homes, except the fact that more people die in college. <laughs> so entrepreneurs connect dots. Entrepreneurs think outside boundaries. Entrepreneurs are crazy enough to actually believe that they could do things that haven't been done before. So this is uh, just what, what goes on. So you really kind of got to be crazy to start a business. So let me give you some facts. Every day in America, 1,100 new companies are formed. Every day in America, 1,100 businesses fail. There's just a 20% probability that a new business will survive its first three years. In 2016, two, there was 3,000 companies that were funded by venture capitalists. In 2016, there were just 40 venture-backed IPOs. You have a 70% more probability of having a heart attack if you're an entrepreneur, two times more likely to get divorced, and three times more likely to go bankrupt. What kind of nut would start a business? So see if you can name that nut. 
He lost his job in 32, defeated for state legislature in 32, failed in business in 33, he had a nervous breakdown in 41, defeating races for Congress in 43, Senate in 55, Vice President in 56, and Senate in 58. So the answer is Abraham Lincoln, 16th president, arguably our greatest president. So overcoming adversity and, and naysayers you know, goes with the territory for entrepreneurs. This legendary entrepreneur was told by teachers that he was too stupid to learn anything. He was fired from his first two jobs because, for lack of productivity. This is Thomas Edison, the inventor of the electric light bulb, the phonograph, the movie camera, who said genius was 99% perspiration, 1% inspiration, founder of General Electric, $260 billion market cap. This entrepreneur of Maverick, his JV partner dropped him, then sued him. His first bank cut him off. His second bank had the FBI investigate him for fraud. Two creditors showed up at his headquarters on the same day, and by the way, the same time to collect. The US Customs slapped with a $10 million bill when he had no money. His star brand endorser died in a car crash, and the replacement wore a competitor's product on global TV. Phil Knight, founder of Nike, $91 billion market cap, just do it. So this creative crazy was unemployed, on welfare, and a single mother, hatched the book idea was stuck on a delayed trade. J.K. Rowling, author of uh, Harry Potter, 400 million books sold, $25 billion in franchise value. So this entrepreneur launched his business in 2007 with three air mattresses, basically from a need to eat. Raised his initial seed capital by selling uh, custom cereal boxes at the 2008 campaign events, Captain McCain's and Obama O's. This is Airbnb, Brian Chesky. 100 million book, nights book last year, $31 billion market value. Last tech titan, last, last entrepreneur. This tech titan failed the Chinese university entrance exam three times. His job as application was rejected by 30 companies, including KFC. Jack Ma, founder of Alibaba, $280 billion market value. So big ideas don't always find a receptive audience particularly in education. In, in fact, Socrates was one of the all-time great innovators and educators. He, he educated Plato and Aristotle, and what did they do? They killed him. <laughs> so as you look at the education landscape, while it's one of the four largest industries in the world by amount spent, you know, the total market cap, the 10 largest market cap public companies is just $61 billion. So put that in contrast to the three other largest industries. Energy, 1.6 trillion. Healthcare, 1.6 trillion. Technology, 3.4 trillion. In fact, if you look at education compared to Google alone, Google is 10 times larger than the 10 largest edu education companies combined. So that's the bad news. The good news is that what's going on in this industry is really special. And you're seeing scaled business models happening at incredible rates. They're solving big problems with tremendous amount of traction. Over the last 10 years, you've seen the VC funding in the education market increase tenfold to $3.1 billion. And CB Insights you know, has, has shown that the education and talent sector has actually 25 companies that it expects could go public in 2017. So you're starting to see the fruits of that investment. You know, so Socrates wasn't wrong, he was just early. There's four gravitational shifts that I'd like to talk about which impact the education and talent industry and really society overall. And the first gravitational shift is digital natives rule. So the class of 2020, the group that went into college last fall, is very, very different than previous classes. So this, this group was born 18 years ago. Also 18 years ago, Google was born in a garage to Larry Page and Sergey Brin. So the class of 2020 has grown up in a world where information was ubiquitous and free. My generation, information was difficult to get and expensive, and water is free, but things have changed. Steve Jobs also came on the scene 18 years ago for a second tour at Apple with the original goal of putting a computer on everybody's desktop and ultimately a computer in your pocket. So the class of 2020 doesn't think of it as a smartphone, it's just a phone. 
and they love it, they do everything on it. From transportation, to eating, to getting products, to consuming entertainment. Uh-oh. Um, and not only, not only this, but they want what they want when they want it, on demand. So binge watching a Netflix show so you don't have to wait the next week to see your favorite, you know, your favorite episode is standard. So it's not a mystery that the class of 2020 thinks it's ridiculous that you gotta show up on Thursday morning, eight o'clock for an economics 101 class. You should just be able to get, take that class wherever you want it, whenever you want it. And 50% of the class of 2020 think that online courses are as good or better than physical courses. They love everything to do with technology. They have no memory of the dot-com bubble bursting. But what they do remember is how their parents lost their home during the financial crisis of 2007 and 2008. And so the millennials, they don't own, it. They don't own homes. It's a 30% reduction in the number of homes that, they've, that they purchased. Um, and they don't buy cars. You know, so there's more cars sold last year to people age 75 or older than 18 to 24 year olds. They also remember how their parents lost the job that they had uh, at, the, at the company that they worked at for their entire career and the pension that went along with it. And the Department of Labor says that the class of 2020 is gonna have 15 careers between the time they graduate from college and the time that they retire. And one of those jobs is likely to be part of the gig economy as a Lyft driver. So in other words, you know, they don't wanna buy cars, but they're happy to share them. Second gravitational shift, geographic, both physical and virtual. So looking in the rear view mirror, uh, the economic engines for the world for the last hundred years was the United States, Japan, Europe, and Canada. So while just 9% of the global population in 2000, these countries represented 52% of all global GDP. But over the last 15 years, the economic growth of these countries has been essentially flat, and demographically, their populations are getting older. So 26% of the population of these countries is older than 60. Just 15% of the population is younger than 15. So in Japan last year, there were more adult diapers sold than baby diapers. Today, these countries' fertility rate is 1.6, so to keep a constant population, you need a 2.0 or greater. So literally, these countries are dying. And their GDP, share of GDP globally is 41% down from 52%. So as we look into the horizon over the, the, over the windshield, what we see is the emerging economic engines for the world we call V-chips. Vietnam, China, India, Indonesia, and the Philippines. So these countries are 43% of the global population. Today, just 28% of global GDP, but their GDP growth is over 8% per year for the last 15 years. Demographically, young populations, just 11% older than 60, and 24% younger than 15. So effectively, the mere opposite of the other countries. And from a fertility rate, 2.3 times fertility, so they're organically growing their population. So the old center of gravity of the economic world looked like this. The new center of gravity looks like this. And you wanna look what's on deck? Here's Africa. Five of the 10 fastest growing countries in the world last year were from Africa. And people talk about China as being like that was yesterday's news in terms of the growth story. When we look at the mega trends of mobile computing, the emphasis on education, and the mega trend of urbanization, we think the, the catalyst for growth in China are open-ended as long as we can see. So just from an urbanization standpoint, the United States has 10 cities with a million or more population. China has 160. Here's what Shanghai looked like in 1990. Here's what Shanghai looks like today. Shanghai's official population is 24 million, but when you talk to demographers, what they say it actually is closer to 40 million when you look at cell phone traffic. That's larger than Canada. Xi'an, 10th largest city in China with 13 million people, is larger than Sweden, and you've never heard of it. So as you look at middle class consumption, today, it's basically tied between Asia Pacific and North America, but you fast forward the clock to 2030, dramatic shift to Asia Pacific. That's where things are going. And you wanna know what a country's priorities are, it's how they spend their money. So you look in the United States and housing, they spent, you know, in the United States, 
households spend approximately 33% of family income on housing. In Asia, it's 10%. You look at education, Asia spends over seven times more on education than what the United States does. In a recent trip to China, this was the headline of the South China Morning Post, which is owned by Alibaba. It talks of this, the story was about this epidemic of nearsightedness with Chinese students because they were studying so hard. In fact, 90% of students, of Chinese students going to college are nearsighted because of that is, is, a, is a major factor. When you look at the biggest market caps in the world 25 years ago, it was Exxon, Philip Morris, Walmart, General Electric, and Merck, basically industrial businesses, manufacturing businesses, and, and most were older than 100 years or, or, or older. If you look at the five largest market cap companies in the world today, it's Apple, Alphabet, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook. Interesting here, the oldest company on this list is Microsoft, and it was started in 1975. But then when you look at the 10th, 11th, and 20th largest market cap companies in the world, Tencent, Alibaba, and China Mobile, not only is it interesting that they're from China, but these companies didn't exist 20 years ago. So what's exciting to us about being in this room and about where the world's heading is the mindset of innovation and entrepreneurship that is made between San Francisco and San Jose, such an amazing place, is going global and it's going viral. So we like to say this, it's going from Austin to Boston, from Chicago to Sao Paulo, from Mumbai to Shanghai to Dubai. This is the global Silicon Valley. So I wrote a book that came out a couple of months ago called The Global Silicon Valley Handbook. You're encouraged to all buy it. We, we, we did. We're, we're, too, we're too cheap to give it away for free. Um, but in the book, we kind of tongue in cheek map out the 50 most innovative markets in the world, who you need to know, where you need to go, what you need to know. And with that, um, you know, provide effectively this map. We were lucky enough to um, have TJ Miller at one of the events that we had, who's from HBO Silicon Valley. So he read the book, and you can see Li Zhang and, and, and Susie Han um, with him. So he gave this this quote, one of the most ridiculous but informative books I've ever read. And so we'll take that as an endorsement, for sure. <laughs> Looking at another shift, and this is virtual. So Facebook today has 1.7 billion members. If they were called citizens, the 1.7 billion citizens would make it the largest country in the world. In many respects, it really is a country. It has its own culture, it has its own rules, it has its own currency, it has its own commerce, it even has its own fake news. <laughs> and virtual reality is now coming to a gymnasium through you, having Shamu um, with, with Magic Leap being the, the group that's able to do this soon. Pokemon Go last summer was an official launch starting gun going off in the augmented reality sector. 500 million downloads in two months, fastest growing game in history. With augmented reality, virtual reality going from a billion market today to $80 billion market by 2025, we're very lucky tonight, after me, to have John, John, John Riccatello, who's the CEO of Unity, which is the software company uh, providing the powerful virtual reality for many of the most exciting games today, you know, including Pokemon Go. So the third gravitational shift is digital disruption and automation. In 1994, Mark Andreessen started Netscape, basically making the internet available to the world. So over the last 23 years, the digital tracks that have been laid that now have 3.7 billion people on the internet. The cost of computing has gone down 99% in those 23 years. The cost of storage is basically free, infinite capacity. 2.6 billion smartphones, 258 billion apps, downloaded last year alone. So as a catalyst uh, to start a lot of things, Amazon with Jeff Bezos was also started in 1994. So in that year, Sears Roebuck had a $16 billion market cap. At one point, Sears Roebuck was actually the largest retailer in the world. Today, Sears Roebuck's market cap is a billion and recently announced that it might have to file for bankruptcy to protect itself from creditors and Amazon's market cap is $450 billion. But it wasn't just uh, Sears that was steamrolled by Amazon. 
It was many different retailers, including from Best Buy to Target to Macy's. In all, about a 60% reduction in market cap over the last 10 years of those companies, or over $100 billion of market value lost. But what's really amazing, in the last six months, department stores have shed 100,000 jobs since October. To put that in perspective, that's more than the total number of coal miners employed in the United States. So when people talk about being worried about the coal miners, what they really should be worried about is the fired retail workers. The good news is e-commerce sector has created 355,000 new jobs since 2007. The bad news is that technology and automation continues to eat jobs. Amazon alone, quote unquote, employs 45,000 robots in its warehouses. In China, they're going to buy 90,000 industrial robots this year, 175,000 by 2020. So overall, there's 350 million manufacturing and warehouse workers whose jobs are at risk or, or likely to go away. So Amazon's latest introductions of weapons of mass disruption is the Echo. And you'll hear a little bit more about the Echo in a, in, uh, in a few minutes. But you know, what the Echo basically is a, is a voice automated personal operating system. And it's growing very fast. So 10 million units have been sold already, 40 million expected by 2020. And the skills of the Echo are becoming quite significant, have increased 12 times in the last 12 months. And to give you a little bit of a window to what this future of having your own personal operating system might look like, I'm going to play a quick clip from her with Joaquin Phoenix. Mr. Theodore Twombly, welcome to the world's first artificially intelligent operating system, OS1. We'd like to ask you a few basic questions before the operating system is initiated. This will help create an OS to best fit your needs. Okay. Are you social or antisocial? I guess I haven't really been social in a while, mostly because... In your voice, I sense hesitance. Would you agree with that? Was I sounding hesitant? Yes. No, sorry if I was sounding hesitant. I was just trying to be more accurate. Would you like your OS to have a male or female voice? Female, I guess. How would you describe your relationship with your mother? That was fine, I think. Um, well, actually, I think the thing I always found frustrating about my mom is, you know, if I, if I tell her something that's going on in my life, her reaction is usually about her. <laughs> it's not about... Thank you. Please wait as your individualized operating system is initiated. So, does that sound ridiculous? Well, the Echo's already had 250,000 marriage proposals to it. And last week, new features that announced were whispering and pausing for emphasis. So this is happening. So Andrew Ng is our keynote speaker on Wednesday at lunch. He's talking about AI being the new electricity. And you want to see what impact the old electricity had on the economy and, and work. You know, 200 years ago, 95% of the work population was in agriculture. By 2020, 87% of the work population is going to be in knowledge and services, with a large part of that catalyzed by the introduction of electricity. So if you want to know what the future of work looks like and what 2120 looks like, what a lot of people do is uh, to predict the future, they extrapolate the present, which you know, a lot of smart people even do that. You know, Mark Zuckerberg talks about everybody should be a programmer because he'll hire any qualified programmer because they just have an insatiable demand for it. And in fact, there's 1.2 million computer science jobs opening by 2020. No less an expert than the Harvard Business Review talks about data science being the sexiest job of the 21st century. It's sexy because there's a huge demand imbalance for high paying jobs. The problem with this thinking is basically this graph. Human capabilities are on a linear growth curve, and computers and technology are on an exponential curve. And we're here. What this is basically saying is that pretty soon, the technology will be replacing the technologist, as well as a lot of other skilled jobs that, that people can't imagine today. So McKinsey has estimated that there's 12 million skilled jobs that will be eliminated by 2025. And it's not just telephone, teleservice people. The Goldman Sachs trading the equity trading desk has gone from 600 people to two. 
And by 2025, it's estimated that robots will, will manage $7 trillion. Already, the Associated Press uses robots to do financial analysis and reports on 3,000 companies every single quarter. So what does that mean? That in the future, money is going to be managed by robots making decisions from inputs from other robots. Add this all up, and 50% of all jobs are at risk of replacement in the next 20 years. So smart people like Paul Krugman, who won the Nobel laureate, says, you know, we could be looking at a society which all the gains and wealth accrue to whoever owns the robots. Bill Gates recently said, if a robot comes to do a human job, you'd think that we'd tax at a similar level. Sam Altman, who runs Y Combinator, says the obvious conclusion is that government will just have to give people money. And for some people, that sounds like a pretty good future. I mean, basically, you sit around in togas, drinking wine, eating grapes. But the problem with that thinking is effectively, this is not a new phenomenon. This has been going on for, some, for a number of years. In fact, John Maynard Keynes talked about 1930, this new disease called technological unemployment. And then you go back even a few more years. It's Queen Elizabeth in 1580 worried about this new sewing technology. She said, I have too much regard for the poor knitters to approve an invention that will deprive them of their employment and reduce them to starvation. And then you go back a few years before that, King Solomon, who was considered to be the wisest person ever in the world, said, the plow is the devil and the beginning of the end of man. Now, he didn't actually say that, I made that up, but the rest is all true. <laughs> so as sure as the sun comes up on the east, we know that automation is going to continue to eat jobs, but what doesn't eat, work. So for the fourth gravitational shift, we talk about the knowledge economy. And what does that mean, and where does that, where does that lead us? So we all know there's a direct correlation between your level of education and your income. Also, there's a direct correlation between your education and your employment. And now what the data is starting to show is there, the more educated you are, the less likely you're going to be disrupted by technology, at least in the near term. So what the obvious thing you think is, well, that means I just need to get more education so I can stay relevant and productive. But the problem is the way that most people do that is they go to school or college and that's both disruptive for their life and it costs a lot of money. In fact, college education has grown three and a half times inflation since 1980, twice the level of healthcare. Also, you look at uh, college debt, it's almost tripled just in the last 10 years. So to figure out how to get the knowledge that you need is not gonna be in a traditional way. You're gonna have to be able to fill up your knowledge tank continuously, what we call Kaizen EDU, sorry, which is continuous learning. But the best way that that's going to happen is invisibly and seamlessly. You're going to be learning without thinking about it. You're going to be learning because that's just the way it's going to be. And so if you look at the old system, you played from 0 to 5, you learned from 5 to 25, you earned from 25 to 65, and then you retired. The new system is you're going to learn from the time you're born to the time you retire if you ever retire. And that's just the reality, but, it has, but it's going to be in a visible, seamless way. So that gets us to our conclusion, which is network effects. And so we think that network effects are a huge component in how we create the solutions to have everybody have an op equal opportunity to participate in the future. So the classic definition of network effects is every node added to the network creates exponential value as opposed to linear value. The best network effects businesses are seamless and invisible. They're basically natural. They happen naturally. So an example of this is ladies' night, which supply induces, supply, uh, induces demand and then reinforces itself. Probably the greatest network effects business of all time is Facebook, which every single new member adds exponential value to the network. But for an example of a great product that was disrupted off the face of the earth almost by a competitor that introduced a product that had network effects, Think of BlackBerry. So 10 years ago, BlackBerry was, you know, people loved their BlackBerry. In fact, they're so popular with their users, they were called Crackberries. Remember that? And then Apple comes out with their iPhone, and their innovation wasn't the phone, but it was really the app store. And each app increased the value to the users on that network, and each new person on the network had incentives for, the, for new apps to be built. And that effect was pretty amazing. So 10 years ago, when Apple introduced the iPhone, the market cap for BlackBerry and Apple was essentially the same. Not anymore. 
Apple has the largest market cap in the world, and BlackBerry has basically gone away. So we think about network effects in education. It's about connecting people. It's connecting ideas and opportunities to create exponential outcomes. So how we see it is talent is on the supply side, and work is on the demand side. An issue here is that only 30% you know, of this talent has a, has a college degree or better, and on the work side, 65% or more of all jobs being created require either college education or skills of the equivalent. So the opportunity is for education to fill the middle here, and that's what we see as the real opportunity for network effects. But another way to look at it is basically we're networking education and talent to work. That's what we think real network effects are. And some quick examples of this is the military veteran that takes the finance course from Wharton through Coursera to get, a, to get to be a commercial banker. It's the current college student that uses Chegg's student graph to get a relevant internship or have the right major. It's the mother that left the workforce to raise her kids, then wants to get reconnected, take and reboot, to get connected, to get confident, and be able to get that job in the future. It's the recent college graduate that needs to go to finishing school so they have skills, effectively, that are employable. <laughs> and General Assembly is a, is a player in this, you know, helping with things like graphic design. Companies like AT&T with 120,000 workers that need to retool that workforce using people like Udacity and Coursera to do that. It's the middle manager taking, taking the North Carolina MBA online through 2U that's looking for the promotion. And it's the people in sub-Sahara Africa who have lots of talent but little opportunity getting networked with Adele to be able to code to get employed by the largest and most important technology companies in the world. Those are the network effects that we think are so powerful. And we think the opportunity here over the next couple of days is really think about how these network effects can be formed, changing the world for good, and giving everybody an equal opportunity to participate in the future. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dave Balter. And I was going to do something that's better. Okay. How many of us show of hands on an Amazon Alexa or Google Home device? Put your hands up. Okay. Well, you guys are not alone. Uh, in, 11, uh, in 2016, 11 million of these uh, devices already existed, and in Q1 of 2017, another 10 million were sold. Statistics show that by 2020, 128 million of these devices will be in people's homes, and combined with other uh, voice-first devices, that means that more than half of the U.S. population will have a voice assistant in their home. As a matter of fact, out of the 12,700 skills that are in the Amazon Alexa store, nearly 12% are already for education, which begs the question, how will education be transformed by these devices? Uh, we run a company called Milestone. Milestone has spent about a year building a tool that takes photographs, all those photographs that you have on your phone, and translates them into stories that you can listen to on Alexa devices. So here are some pictures of a uh, trip that somebody took to Puerto Rico, and literally just by giving them to our system, it's able to translate it into a story that includes things about objects in the photos, themes, et cetera. Uh, so people ask us, how do we make this magic happen? Well, there are two things at work. Uh, one is computer vision. So we use computer technology in order to ab abstract out objects and data and information and themes from those photos. Um, the second thing is even more magical. We have a team of artificial intelligence hamsters. They go through the photos uh, and they use their algorithms to turn those into stories. Okay? We pay them very little, but they, they work hard. Okay, so to give you an example of this, um, our friends at Classroom Dojo here uh, gave us a few photos uh, of their uh, uh, school experiences and we're going to ask for uh, a memory. So, uh, Alexa, ask Milestone Memories to tell us about Class Dojo. 
Here's your memory about Plastojo. Today Holly went on a field trip with the rest of her classmates. It was a great chance for her to burn off all her wiggles and frolic in nature. Usually, Holly reads with her friends, or else scans for clues with a magnifying glass. But in the fresh air of a hiking trail, she learned about plants and animals. When all the kids got tuckered out, they sat down by the bridge and waited for the bus to arrive. It had been a day full of adventures, and Holly couldn't wait to tell her parents all about it. So you can see uh, the opportunities are pretty endless here. Imagine taking a set of photos of anything and turning it into a learning experience that other people can appreciate, learn from, or preserve for the future. Uh, so we want to give you a tiny bit of an experience of this. So here's the little game we're going to play. You need to uh, pull out your phone, go to milestone.com forward slash edtech. Take five photos of anything. It can be of this event, which would be wonderful. Uh, but it could be from anything that is an education experience. Uh, when you do that, you submit it to our system. We do the rest. This will come back to you as a story that you can recall on an Alexa device or off the web, etc. Uh, the 15 best stories, we are going to send you an Amazon Alexa dot. So uh, get your game on, send us your awesome stories. Uh, for those who want to hear more, um, for those who want to hear more, whatever just happened, you can win a dot. <laughs> Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome John Tuttle. The demo is leaving. Hey, good evening, everybody. So um, I'm John Riccatello, and I have the great pleasure to lead a cool company called Unity Technologies. Now, a little on my background. Um, I spent about 20 years in the game industry and had the opportunity to lead electronic arts twice. And um, it was an amazing, amazing experience. And before I dive into more of what my subject matter is, I'd like to start with a couple of stories. So one of these stories goes back to the year 2000. Um, in the year 2000, I was skiing. I was sitting on the chairlift, and a chatty little 10-year-old sat next to me. And I was talking to him, and he started telling me literally, the, the scores for every game that had taken place that year so far played by the Green Bay Packers. But he, he didn't just tell me who won and lost. He told me literally play by play what happened in a lot of the games, and he could describe the teams they played and who they were. He could describe them offense, players by name, defense, players by name, special teams, players by name. Somehow it seemed like he must have had the voice of John Madden in his ear. And I was kind of struck by that, and I, and I was partly right. I asked him, I said, well, where did you learn all this stuff? And he said he was a Madden gamer. He'd gone online, he played all the time. And he learned all 1,500 of those names, their strengths and weaknesses, what was involved in playing that game, because he lost. He lost and lost and lost and learned along the way until he won. And that's the point. He was involved in something deeply inter interactive, and he was more learning by doing than doing by learning. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that more in a few minutes. Another story, um, I have two beautiful daughters, and I can recall when they were tween aged, and um, I got involved in their PTA, and I ended up being the chairman of the PTA Tech Committee. And I live in Silicon Valley, and their opportunity is literally everywhere. Um, you know, we spend way too much money educating our kids in arcane sciences and the like. And I thought I had my perch, one of the premier schools in all of Silicon Valley, a place where our kids were going to get ahead. And there I was, chairman of the Parent Tech Committee. Now, as chairman of the Parent Tech Committee, I expected to be dazzled because they had a, a big program. And they were going to educate my kids to know so much more than I could have learned at any point in my life. And what did they do? They showed me a program of how they were going to teach the teachers to use PowerPoint and Word and Outlook and Excel and some basic tools. I, I, I nearly started to cry. They were teaching the teachers and through them our children to consume technology. They were a million miles away from learning to create technology. They weren't talking at all about it. Now, I obviously had my lecture and I pushed them in a different direction. And that's frankly what tonight's conversation is about and what I'm going to share with you today. 
Now, I want to introduce Unity and who we are as a company. I could start by telling you, you know, what Unity the game engine is. That's what we make. Now, ours is a product known by virtually every game developer or content developer in the world. You probably don't know what it is. Well, it's a set of tools that basically does all the stuff under games. Animation and lighting and physics and basic interaction and how controls work. How to get it to the iPhone or Android or a PC or a Mac. That's what our technology does and many, many, many game developers build on top of that. In fact, about half the world's game developers build on top of that and about two-thirds of the world's developers for AR and, build, and, and VR build on top of our technology. Now, before I go any further, um, I'd like to dig a little bit into another introduction to my company, what this slide's about. I can talk about financials, although we're private, so I can't talk about it here, but I could talk about a lot of things. I think the way to understand our company the best is to understand what we try to do every day when we wake, wake up, what our mission is. We look at our audience of developers, people that do the hard job of creating content, and we try to solve three things. We want to put powerful tools in their hands, whether they can afford it or not. That's democratizing development. We want to solve really hard problems in physics or lighting and animation so they don't have to do those mundane tasks. And we want to enable their success. We do a lot of things to help them find an audience or to help them find revenue where they otherwise wouldn't. So there's my company. We make a game engine. Lots of people use it. And this is what we try to do. But before I go any further, I'd like to dig into a subject that I'm really passionate about and I've mentioned a couple of times already. It's the world of AR and VR. Now, this is the world of Oculus. It's the world of you know, the Samsung Gear, HoloLens from Microsoft, Cardboard, or, or other platforms from Google. This is the world where you put on a head-mounted display and you are inside the action. You're inside the experience. And I personally believe it's the final platform. And I want to give you some sense of what I mean by that. When my parents were children, the first time a visual screen came into the house was a television set, black and white. It was about 15 feet away from the couch. And they all sat around and watched all the things that you watched. I have no clue in, in the days gone by. When I was um, young, they introduced the PC. And we had a screen, yay, three feet away. And we typed on a, with, a, with a keyboard and then ultimately a mouse. But that 15 feet got a lot closer. And as recently as the last decade, we all got one of these things. And the screen that we interact with, uh-oh, a phone call. Anyway, the screen we interact with got right here, inches away from our face. There is a consistent evolution here. And that evolution is from 15 away to two, three feet away to six inches. And with AR and VR, you step right into the experience. Now, I'm a giant believer that this changes everything. We are going to be inside these experiences. And I believe in the fullness of time, 10, 15 years, maybe 20 years at the outside, we are going to see billions, I didn't say millions, billions of people with some sort of head-mounted display interacting with the world. Whether they're at work, where they would otherwise be at a flat screen, that data will be all right here. Whether they're at home, you know, being entertained on a game system, their house will be the game system that they're wandering around in. Whether they're electricians and the experience helps them be smarter on the, you know, when they're putting things together. And I, I hate to imagine it ever gets to this. You know, maybe they work for the police and they're diffusing a bomb. But the data in front of them, brought into their eyes by one of these devices, is going to tell them exactly what the red wire does, and the blue wire does, and the green wire does, and which one to cut with precision. And I, as I said, I, don't become, I hope it doesn't come to that, but that is precisely where we're going. A world where AR and VR is that pervasive. So why, why do I believe that? Well, first off, I sort of work at the place that's the foundation for a lot of this stuff. I've seen it. But there's something else I can tell you that would give you confidence to believe like I do. The most valuable companies on this planet, from Google to Microsoft to Facebook and many others, are investing tens of billions, if not hundreds of billions of dollars to make this true. This inevitable evolution from 15 feet to three to six inches to you being fully inside the experience. Now, we talk about a lot about democratization at at Unity, where we try to put powerful tools in the hands of developers, whether they can afford them or not. What has this got to do with education? Why am I here today? 
So one thing we try to do, and it's very serious for us, is we try to bring that all the way to the hobbyist, to the student. And democratizing creativity, what am I talking about here? Well, earlier I'd said that we do things like lighting and physics and animation and all that stuff. We do all the hard, repetitive stuff so the user can be left free to create. They can make amazing things, and they do using Unity. There's other tools out there. But ultimately, these powerful tools are going to enable literally millions, if not billions, of people to be technology and content creators. The second thing we like to talk about is democratizing opportunity. And it's one thing to learn the skills, but it's another thing to get a pathway to a job or to find the team that you can assemble around that job. We saw those as hard problems, and we created a, a thing called Unity Connect. I'll talk about that in a minute. But it essentially connects the dots for them. And lastly, democratizing impact. What is that about? Well, I think a simple truth is that point that I mentioned to you earlier about the, the football experience and that boy with his Madden experience, he was learning by doing, not doing by learning. And that's all about being interactive, where your, your experience isn't a one-way communication from a teacher. You are interacting with other students. You're interacting cooperatively, competitively. And you know, one way to think about this is you know, back to the stories of when I was a boy. When I was a boy, they said, you know, learn or uh, live and learn the notion that you'd sort of gain experience over time. I think what I'm learning from the game industry and what I learned from interaction and how people absorb information, more to the point is you learn by dying or you learn by failing and trying again and again and again. And that's what's at the root of interaction. It drives more engagement, more fun, more involvement. And for you out there that are in the world of, of creation, for the world of education, whether you're a developer or a publisher, this is a better place to be if you want that learning to stick to the, the child of those you're trying to educate. Now, earlier with the notion of content creation, I'd mentioned this idea that we help create and find an audience. What did I mean by finding an audience? This is a capture from earlier today of the installs of just the mobile games built in Unity that have been launched over the last several months and what's being installed. Today, 50 million times today, someone around the world will install a game built in Unity. That's 7,000 downloads per second, 24 hours a day. The point I'm making, you can find an audience for this stuff. It's out there. If you make it interactive, they find it. And as I said, this is a big, big number. Another number that's worth mentioning is you're joining good company. 55% of the mobile games are built in these technologies, the technologies we provide. So again, you're joining a large audience. You're joining the right folks. It's two-thirds of the world's VR and AR experiences are built in this technology. And you're, you're building a group of people, 6 million strong, that are reaching 2.4 billion unique devices around the world. That's more than all the televisions combined. So if I had to sum up this notion of uh, democratizing creativity, we help them make it, and we help them find an audience that matters so they can get somewhere with it. Now, another point is this opportunity, Unity Connect. I would mentioned earlier, very important, that not only do they need to be educated, they know how to make it, they need to be able to either find a job or find a team to help them make it. Unity Connect launched earlier, I'd say about, what, November of past year, still in beta. It's shocking how much uptake there is on this. It, it's, it's a place where creators can publish their portfolio, whether it's code or it's art or it's games. And, and the people that need to employ those people find them online very quickly. There are tons of services if you've got an engineering background to find a job. There are tons of services and networks if you're an MBA. But if you've got the tools and you've got the skills in the world of content creation, technology creation, you don't already work for a big company. It's really hard. And this is one way to solve one piece of that puzzle. Now, lastly, I'm going to return to the point of impact, the point of interaction equals engagement. Now, I started with a story about football. I mentioned the NFL and the, the boy in the chairlift. And that's not a fake story. It's a real story. But let's think of another example of whether we really do learn by doing or do by learning. Let's think skiing, for example. I remember the first time I learned to ski. It was quite a long time ago. Somebody told me, lean downhill. I'm supposed to somehow stand on the edge of a cliff and lean that way. Okay, 
this is not what occurred to me as the right idea. It's not what occurs to any of us. And here we are in you know, beautiful Salt Lake City, all these great mountains behind us. This only makes sense in the context of having your skis and boots on and someone giving you a little bit of a shove and you getting a sense of what it feels to edge your skis and to lean into a turn. You learn the skill by doing it and practicing it. You ne almost never learn by reading it. It's almost impossible. And so many things are like that. So the profound point I want to make, and it's a super important one, you learn by doing and by failing and by doing it again and by failing again. And through failure and through the magic of interaction, whether it's, it's cooperative or it's competitive, it doesn't matter. You learn through that action of serial failure and ultimately getting to a better outcome and a success. The point that I'm making is we've created systems in the world sometimes where we sort of grade on a curve. In the world of games, in the world of AR and VR, in all of these things, you get to do it as many times as you want until you've mastered the skill. So look, this is a, a pretty simple message. I think engagement equals learning squared. It's better. And I can't think of, frankly, any better invitation to the 800 million learners in the world today to get an education to get the right tools, to get a device that will help them create and join the program. It's wide open, and I think there's endless opportunity. Anyway, thanks, everybody. Appreciate your time this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Edward Billos. Wondering if the text is available. Well, I'll begin without it and see how my memory is doing. It's a great pleasure to be here tonight. Thank you very much. Uh, it's so wonderful to be in an environment with uh, so many extraordinary and talented people. I've been very fortunate to have a career that's allowed me to work with some of the finest artists and educators and innovators, beginning first at Lincoln Center and now with institutions around the world. I began my work at the age of 21, and so I guess you could say that my passion for arts and education is a pre-existing condition. So I'm hoping you'll catch that bug tonight and take it home to your communities as well. There's exciting new terrain that's forming at the intersection of the arts, technology, and learning. And this terrain is inspiring engineers, designers, scholars, artists, and teachers to work across disciplines and create innovative multimedia programs and experiences that are changing the way we learn and the way we create. I find this new terrain incredibly exciting, and so this year I launched Virtua Creative, a new company that will produce live and virtual experiences designed to foster collaboration, inspire imagination, and nurture interdisciplinary thinking. Virtual Creative already has an exciting portfolio of pr projects in the works. We're developing projects with National Public Television, with the Google Cultural Institute, with the uh, National World War I Centennial Commission, the Kauffman Center for the Performing Arts, the uh, uh, Fordham University, and arts institutions in Europe and Asia. Uh, a project that I'm particularly interested about that I really is the reason I'm here to share with you today is called Everything is Connected. It's a live stage, a multimedia stage, and virtual reality experience that shows kids and allows them to explore the links between the creative arts and academic subjects. The platform for Everything is, Canated will, uh, Everything is Created will allow students and artists from around the globe to collaborate and contribute to the production. I've invited three incredibly talented young artists with me today uh, to give you a little peek at some of the very early stages of the collaborations, which will be premiered next May in 2018 at the Kauffman Center for the Performing Arts. Our artists are violinist Chelsea Starbuck-Smith, 
percussionist Adam Malouf, and singer Alita Moses. You'll notice that Alita has some uh, controllers in, on her wrists and hands that will allow her to use her voice, to extend the range of her voice, interact with artists both here and in different locations, as well as in, in virtual environments. So some of the kind of Tai Chi choreographed kind of motion that you'll notice is her actually shaping the sound and the space and the visuals of what you'll see and hear. And eventually that will take place again here and in other performing arts centers uh, in different locations. You'll see some little clips, the very first stages of a ballerina and another dancer who are beginning to collaborate with us. And they were filmed using motion capture technology. The output of their data is also changing the projection design and the sound design in very, very interesting ways. So I'd like to ask if you would to imagine a year from now when these various artists and designers and engineers and architects and writers come together uh, and produce this wonderful, exciting stage event. Everything is connected will premiere at the Kauffman Center for the Performing Arts. If you're interested in learning more or perhaps participating with us, please come down to our booth at Tomorrowland or email us at virtualcreative.com. So please enjoy.
see all the signs Touch me so softly, sending shivers down my spine Let's seize this moment and lose track of all time By the end of the night, you'll be Awesome or what? Give those guys another round, of a real round. So it's my privilege to introduce our final keynote of the evening, All Roads Lead to LinkedIn. We truly have the rock stars of the talent industry with us tonight. I'm just going to announce their names and let them go so you get the most time with them. First, we have Gerald Chertavian, who is the founder CEO of Europe. We have Tom Davidson, CEO of Everfi. And of course, if we have all roads lead to LinkedIn, we have to have the CEO of LinkedIn, Jeff uh, Wiener. So please give him a hand coming up. Hello, hello. Thank you all for uh, staying here so late to uh, hear some words of wisdom from my friends here. And uh, it's really great to see you all. Um, uh, first off, to just kick off, I'd love to start with you, Gerald. Uh, tell us a little bit about, uh, give us one minute on Year Up. Tell us why you started it. Tell us about your reach and your work with Opportunity Youth. And in fact, maybe for this group, uh, define for us what what opportunity youth means to you. Sure, thank you, Tom. Pleasure to be with you. Uh, good evening. So opportunity youth uh, is a word that uh, technically means between the ages of 16 and 24, uh, out of school and out of work. And you don't have more than a high school degree. Now, interestingly, that's about 17% of all 16 to 24 year olds in the United States of America. And for communities of color, it's about 23%. So effectively, that definition applies to almost one out of four young adults of color in the United States today. Opportunity youth, they were formerly called disconnected youth, which we found pejorative because our young adults did nothing to disconnect. They happen to be born unconnected in many respects uh, and just lack opportunity to get into the mainstream workforce. And that, you know, that's what we founded Year Up on premise 17 years ago that we could work with those wonderfully talented young men and women, and in one year, help them move from either low income or no income to a professional career in companies like Everfi and LinkedIn, um, and show that they could be the best source of talent that a company could get access to. So that was the premise 17 years ago and 17,000 students ago uh, who have now gone through the program. And tell us a little, we were talking a little earlier, not just the reach, but the amount of capital that you've deployed against this problem has been pretty extraordinary. Give, give the folks a little bit of background on that. So we're now a $135 million organization. Uh, we happen to be the fastest, largest, uh, largest, fastest growing youth serving organization started in this century. And we've now consumed uh, close to a billion dollars of uh, capital in one way, shape, or form over that 17 years. Amazing, amazing. So Jeff, <clears throat> you talked to your employees a few weeks ago, and you talked a lot about this concept of a fourth industrial revolution where, um, I don't know if it's right to say there are gonna be winners and there are potentially gonna be losers from this. Uh, that innovation is gonna open some doors, it's gonna make it more difficult for others. Can you talk a little bit about that? Talk about your philosophy around that, how you, what you're doing at LinkedIn to deal with that. Yeah, so it, it's not, uh, first of all, thank you for having us. It's wonderful to be here and, and on stage with two guys I have a tremendous amount of respect for. 
Uh, with regard to the fourth industrial revolution, uh, certainly not our words or narrative. Uh, World Economic Forum has been talking about this for some time now. At LinkedIn, over the last several years, we've recognized that there's going to be an increasing need uh, for us to realize and operationalize our vision of creating economic opportunity for every member of the global workforce, in part, uh, not only because of some of the themes that Gerald was just talking about, the opportunity divide, uh, widening socioeconomic stratification, uh, youth-based unemployment, which is on the rise, and this broadening and widening skills gap, but increasingly the acceleration of technology, innovation, and uh, the increasing displacement of people from the workforce. This fourth industrial revolution uh, is the next in a progression that really started uh, at the turn of the last century with mechanization, the steam engine, and then mass production and the assembly line and factories. Uh, automation and the rise of electronics and, and basic computing. And the fourth will be robotization. And that's going to mean uh, AI, the rise of AI, and the rise of drones and sensors and things that ultimately have the potential, of course, robots to uh, displace our workforce and displace workers. And whereas this started years ago uh, as a consistent theme in science fiction, uh, predicting a dystopian future, uh, in the last several years, uh, there's certainly been greater recognition that this really could happen. And most recently, uh, at Davos this year, uh, for the World Economic Forum, this was kind of the talk of the town amongst heads of state, amongst CEOs, uh, there's increasing recognition that this is no longer science fiction. It's no longer about the future. It's happening. And the WEF uh, predicts that by the year 2020, uh, 7 million gross jobs will be displaced, 2 million will be added, 5 million net displaced uh, from the global workforce. There are other reports uh, that take the time frame out to, say, 2025, and it's dramatically higher estimates in terms of uh, folks that could be uh, materially and dramatically impacted. You, you don't need to look any further than uh, your favorite news source, and it seems like every other week now there's a different report of an Asian manufacturing company that's going to replace tens of thousands of people with robots, uh, not in five years' time, but uh, in the next year. Uh, there's talk now of major uh, retailers, and those retailers who are still maintaining growth and scale uh, moving to drones, for example, or robots within their warehouses. And uh, it's, it's coming. So the question is, how are we going to prepare our workforce for the jobs that are and will be, and not just the jobs that once were? And at LinkedIn, it's become uh, very central to our thinking, what we're trying to accomplish. So you two have worked together for a while on these issues. How, how many years have you all partnered up on LinkedIn, probably since we started in the Bay Area, so almost, you know, coming on 10 years ago. And uh, what's interesting is uh, Jeff and I are approaching s similar challenges from different ends of a spectrum. We're thinking all the time about where are the skills we need to teach for tomorrow. Kind of as Wayne Gretzky says, where's the puck going in terms of skills? And how do you be demand-driven if you're in education, right? What are the needs of the market? How do we respond to those needs? Um, we've worked uh, with LinkedIn, placed hundreds of young people into LinkedIn, um, in part, in, in, in Everfire as well, in part because the leadership says, we actually aren't going to purely use credentials as a way to sort human beings. We're going to think about competency. We're not just going to look at pedigree to say, do you get a look in our company? We're going to look at professionalism. And for our young people who uh, get to go to LinkedIn, um, I thought uh, you'd be interested to see how they feel about getting an opportunity to work in such a great company. So let's take a look at the day we announce to our students where they get to go to their internship after they've been training for six months. This will give you a sense of what it feels like to work at LinkedIn. Let's take a look. Let's walk a little bit. So I have the pleasure of announcing a company whose website founded in 2003. And I know for a fact that every single individual in this room uses it. Whoa, 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 whoa. I got some more information. <laughs> this company has been incredibly successful, specifically in the business world, and their aim is to connect professionals to opportunities around the world. All right. So, while they do have a website, they also gain revenue through professional services, talent solutions, 
and marketing packages. So, without any further ado, going to guest LinkedIn from LCS, Web Miracles. <laughs> so, awesome. now, have you ever heard of millennials being entitled? That's the opposite of entitlement. That's someone who said, I didn't have opportunity in my life, and I now have an opportunity to go to one of the best companies out there, LinkedIn, and actually, I want that job, I'll work hard for that job. That, are, that represents millions, millions of Americans who could be your next best employee, and they're hidden from view. Um, but not when you get leaders like Tom and Jeff who give people visibility to our world. So thank you for being a great leader there. Yeah, Appreciate and it. And thank you for making that kind of talent available to us. You see that kind of response, and that's the energy that uh, some of the year up graduates bring to us. And we, we have the privilege of working with uh, some other amazing programs, uh, Management Leaders for Tomorrow by way of example. And when you see that kind of passion and fire in the belly, when you see that kind of work ethic, what's not captured there is the growth mindset and the perseverance, the loyalty. Uh, these are qualities that you don't necessarily pick up from a degree. Uh, there are qualities, non-cognitive skills sometimes, that have a tendency to be completely overlooked when people are sifting through resumes or LinkedIn profiles. And yet, increasingly, we find that these are the kinds of people that make the biggest difference within our organization. And one of the things we're dedicated to right now is trying to figure out a way to scale that. And working with organizations like Everify, working with organizations like Europe and MLT, and figuring out how, as a platform, we can do a better job of surfacing that kind of talent. Jeff, if you go, so you've got a lot of people out here who are startup founders. They're, they're running fantastic ed tech companies. And if you go back in time, and if you think about someone who's starting an organization of 20 people or 15 people, what's your advice for them around these issues, around hiring, opportunity? Um, I, I've found one of the biggest challenges at Everfi has been, um, there have been areas where we've done this really well. There have been areas where we haven't done it well. And how hard it is if you get behind on those issues in terms of hiring, diversity, others. What advice do you have for people that are, are starting a company now? They've got 20 or 30 employees. How should they be thinking about this? Yeah, if you're starting a company today, you have the luxury of establishing processes without legacy. And one of the things we're wrestling with right now, which I know a number of companies in the Valley, not just companies in the Valley, financial institutions on a global basis, trying to take leadership roles uh, with regard to relaxing some of these uh, traditional requirements that you see on the resume or you see on a job description, uh, years of experience or the kind of school you want to, uh, we used to pride ourselves on recruiting from an incredibly short list of universities. And a lot of companies in the Valley did the same thing. We would pride ourselves, oh, we only recruit from school A or school B or school C. And we're certainly not alone. We recently conducted a little bit of research leveraging LinkedIn profiles and looked at tech workers uh, within the Valley, and only 5% of them came from non-traditional backgrounds. Only 5%. Gerald knows this all too well. So today, we're in a position where we've got this huge infrastructure and this huge recruiting machine and hiring machine and practices, and it's, a lot of this is baked into the DNA, and yet we're highly cognizant of unconscious biases. We're highly cognizant of the inertia in our system. And we're starting to question all of it. And we're revisiting first principles and revisiting assumptions. So if I was starting today, I'm baking in diversity. I'm baking in inclusion. I'm baking in belonging into these practices from day one. Mm -hmm. I'm starting to think about things like the Rooney Rule and not necessarily checking boxes in terms of numbers, diversity numbers, but ensuring that we're looking at underrepresented minorities and people that you wouldn't necessarily have an opportunity to meet with and interview uh, for key roles. We're focusing on the fact that around a table, we need decision makers that come from a diverse set of perspectives. Once again, not for the sake of it, not for the sake of talking about numbers, but because our decision makers need to be 
reflective of the people we serve, our members and our customers. And to the extent we're not aligned, we're not able to do that, we're going to be making suboptimal decisions. So these are some of the things I'd be thinking about from day one. What's, um, particularly on the engineering front, you've done something around these REACH apprenticeships. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about this? Yeah, would love to. This is a brand new program. We're incredibly excited about it. It's still very early days, so we've got to make sure it's successful first. Uh, but this year, we started an apprenticeship program uh, at LinkedIn. We've got 29 uh, people in our first cohort. And uh, this is trying to get away from this idea that everyone on the engineering team, everyone we recruit, has to have come from a specific school and has a specific kind of degree. Yes, CS degrees from uh, specific schools can lead uh, to us finding incredible talent, but it's not the exclusionary domain of incredible talent. This is what we all need to bear in mind. Uh, increasingly, I hear this mantra, skills, not degrees. It's not skills at the exclusion of degrees. It's just expanding our perspective to go beyond degrees. And so uh, with this particular cohort, we're finding uh, that people with uh, very basic coding skills, but have, uh, say, graduated from a, a coding boot camp. And last year in the United States, uh, 91 boot camps, graduating 18,000 uh, folks with this basic level of coding experience. Uh, we're looking for folks like that. We're looking for people with a growth mindset. We're looking for people with the dedication, with the work ethic, and we want to give them a shot. And what we're finding is these people are a lot like the people Gerald helps us to source, and they're just incredibly talented. They need a chance. Uh, some of these people come from the most extraordinary backgrounds. Uh, one of our apprentices who's with us right now uh, was living in a homeless shelter uh, six months ago and ended up building an app that facilitated the way the homeless find shelters. Hmm. And there's just so much talent to be had if people are open uh, to finding this talent in different places. Gerald, you've talked about, you've actually said some pretty provocative in a good way stuff in the past about um, not focusing on the four-year degree, not focusing, but really targeting skills. And I think one of the things that's been extraordinary to me, you know, Jeff and I are peers. We're practically the same level. Um, um, uh, no, but as we've looked at, uh, as we've uh, been lucky enough to, to have a number of year-up graduates come through uh, and, and stay to this day at EverFi, what struck me has been the toughness and the grit of those of those young people, I mean, it's extraordinary. So how do, you, how do you see that as somebody who is really our first, our first line of, um, uh, of opportunity as we're looking um, out in, in our hiring practice? How do you see that? How do you help us figure that out? Talk to me a little bit about that. Well, the, imag imagine if you're hiring someone and you could actually understand what was the degree of difficulty to get to the starting point? For many folks, they travel miles to get to a point where they can even compete. But when we look at people in the static, it's actually very rarely we go back and say, how hard was it for them just to get in front of me? Um, you'd have a very different view of human beings if we looked at degree of difficulty to just be on a place where you could compete. You could sit in front of your good self and uh, advocate for getting a job. And I think, going back to your question, too, is we have to be careful of designing systems in our own likeness. Uh, at least in, in my case. I was fortunate to go to school and then go to work. And let's do a little audience participation. Uh, raise your hand if you have a four-year degree. Keep it up if you got that four-year degree between the ages of 18 and 22. Just look around a bit. Just spin your head around. You are pretty smart. Someone shout out to me, about what percentage of hands do you think is still up? You can put your hands down now. What percentage do you think are still up? 85, 90, a good percentage. Now, if we ask those same two questions, of any 100 Americans today, what percentage of hands would be up across America today? 40, 30. How about eight? Eight hands would be up. The average person in this country who goes to college, 50%, work full time. Half of all the human beings who go to college in America work full time. That's not low income Americans, that's not middle income, that's all Americans. The average age of a Bachelor of Arts is 28.5, right? 
But if we design systems the way I happen to consume it, excuse me, of you went to college at 18, you graduated at 22, that is eight out of 100 adults in the United States of America. We as leaders and people who have externalities associated with cho choices we make have got to be more broad in saying what system encourages us to see a broader array of talented human beings. And I think the thing I think about is where am I replicating what I happen to have experienced as opposed to trying to be more cognizant of what's going on in the broad sway of the people in this country. Right on, right on. Um, so, Jeff, as you, <clears throat> you've spent a lot of time now, one of the advantages that you have is you get to see this play out across millions and millions of data points across an ec economic graph. What are the things that LinkedIn, uh, if you look out three or four years, what's, gonna, what's LinkedIn gonna inform us about in terms of how we think about hiring the jobs that are coming down the road. I mean, you're such a unique perch around all this. Talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, so uh, taking a step back, uh, Tom was just referring to the economic graph, which is uh, one of the main ways in which we want to operationalize and manifest our vision of creating an economic opportunity for every member of the global workforce. So the graph component of that is kind of a fancy way of talking about digitally mapping connections. Facebook is a social graph. It digitally maps relationships, familial relationships between friends and family. Uh, Twitter is an interest graph. Uh, LinkedIn was founded as a professional graph and has created a lot of value by virtue of mapping relationships between professionals. Uh, the economic graph is our vision uh, to digitally map the global economy across six dimensions or six pillars. Uh, so the first is the workforce, and ultimately we want there to be a profile on LinkedIn for every member of the global workforce. There's over 3 billion people in the global workforce. Uh, we recently announced we had signed up our 500 millionth member, uh, so obviously we have a ways to go. That's in part why it's a vision, uh, but we're dedicated to, to seeing that through and trying to accomplish that. Uh, second, we want there to be uh, a digital presence or profile for every company in the world. And when you include small, medium-sized businesses, there's north of roughly 60 million companies in the world. We want there to be uh, a digital representation for every job available at any given time, every open job. And by some estimates, there's as many as 20 million jobs that can be digitally represented. Uh, and we're making great inroads along those lines. Uh, we want there to be a digital representation for every skill required to obtain the jobs offered by those companies. And uh, with the acquisition of Linda, we can now offer coursework. And uh, we're very excited to be rolling out uh, Linda or LinkedIn Learning as a platform that's going to enable uh, organizations uh, to essentially distribute uh, their content, their learning content through our platform to their employees or beyond if they're interested in doing so. So we're going to broaden the amount of coursework that's running through our ecosystem. Uh, we'd also like there to be a digital presence or profile for every university higher educational organization or vocational training facility that enables people to acquire the skills and uh, acquire the knowledge they need to obtain those jobs. And then lastly, the last pillar uh, is for LinkedIn to continue to evolve as a publishing platform that allows for every individual, every company, and every university in the world to share their professionally relevant knowledge if they're interested in doing so. And once this infrastructure is in place, uh, we want to allow capital, all forms of capital, intellectual capital, working capital, and human capital to flow to where it can best be leveraged. And in doing so, we want to help lift and transform the global economy. So it's not even about looking out, Tom, three, five years. We're actually seeing increasing use cases for it today, which is really exciting. So uh, for any locality, anywhere in the world, you can pick any town, city, you can pick any country, uh, and we can work with uh, local government officials and are doing so um, all over the world at this point in various places. And we can identify the fastest growing jobs within that locality, the skills required to obtain those jobs. Uh, we can evaluate uh, the skills of the aggregate workforce within that locality. We can size the gap, the skills gap, between the jobs that are fastest growing and the skills that that workforce currently has. And then ultimately, we can make that data accessible either through APIs or other forms of distribution so that vocational training facilities, junior colleges, and even four-year university programs can actually adjust their curriculum. So you can imagine a just-in-time curriculum, which is going to be far better able to prepare people for new technologies and new job creation. So that's something we're really excited about.
So you talked about the Linda acquisition, so let's hit on that for a second. Um, that went off like a bomb you know, in the ad tech market in a, in a good way and was gonna unleash hundreds of major acquisitions uh, right, right on the heels of that. Uh, talk to us a little bit, so you've had some news this year. Talk to us a little bit how life is different post Microsoft acquisition. Um, how has your world changed? And talk to us a little bit about that. So by design, it, it hasn't really changed. The day-to-day -day is very much the same. So we continue to operate as an independent company. And that was very much by design and something Satya, the CEO of Microsoft, and I discussed prior to announcing the acquisition and closing the acquisition. And he wanted to do this differently. And uh, his priority in terms of value creation for Microsoft is for LinkedIn to continue to grow and accelerate the realization of our mission, our vision, our uh, objectives and targets. And so we can do that both as an independent entity. Uh, we're really excited about our roadmap, but we can certainly accelerate that by virtue of leveraging Microsoft's footprint of over a billion individual users of their software, uh, by leveraging uh, this incredible technical infrastructure that they've been building out over the last several decades. You think about conversational computing and AI, uh, you think about augmented reality and virtual reality, there's so much that we can be doing there, so that's really exciting. Uh, they have extraordinary talent uh, that is working extremely well with our own talent. So there's a lot of uh, room for us to uh, really accelerate what it is that we've set out to accomplish. And so far, so good. It's, we had very high expectations for how this would work. And uh, thus far, uh, they're certainly meeting or exceeding those expectations. So you and I, just to, to stay with you for a second on this, you and I have talked a lot about company cultures over time and how compassion and empathy really drive it, the entirety of your focus on how you manage and how you deal with your people. Gerald, it's obviously in the DNA of everything you do. Um, Jeff, can you talk, I, I've always found it to be a really interesting ethos that you have and focus that you have. Can you just talk a little bit about what that means to manage compassionately and then let's talk a little bit about some things that we've talked about in sure. terms of bringing it, uh, bringing yep. it to that Stuff that uh, we're very excited to uh, announce tonight for the first time. Uh, so uh, if you ask me, you know, in terms of management style, both for myself and uh, something we really try to ensure is cascaded throughout LinkedIn and all of our managers, uh, first principle is managing compassionately. And uh, it's important to draw a distinction between compassion and empathy. Oftentimes in Western society, we have a tendency to use empathy and compassion synonymously, and there's very important differences between the two. Empathy is feeling what another living thing feels. Uh, compassion is putting yourself in the shoes of somebody else, seeing the world through their lens or perspective uh, for the sake of classically defined alleviating their suffering. And within a work environment, it doesn't necessarily have to be as dramatic as alleviating suffering. It can also be just helping somebody or achieving an objective. And managing compassionately, uh, we find to be incredibly valuable in terms of forging connections and building the right kind of trust, the right kind of shorthand, uh, the right kind of camaraderie, and the right kind of teamwork and collaboration. And it essentially comes from an understanding that uh, when you experience any kind of conflict within an organization, and we all experience conflict all the time, uh, no matter how wonderful everyone thinks they are and how wonderful their organizations are, uh, there's conflict. There's conflict multiple times on a daily basis. And more often than not, when we experience conflict, take at work for example, we uh, more often than not knee jerk to assuming ill intention by the other person that they're being political or they're out to get us or they must be ignorant or how in the world could they possibly disagree uh, with what you believe to be the right answer. And uh, as a result of that, uh, if that person gets defensive or angry, uh, the individual on the receiving end of that can get defensive and angry, and then it escalates. And before long, you've got very little chance of resolving whatever conflict exists amicably, let alone actually collaborating and getting to a better answer. And so managing compassionately is starting with being a spectator of your own thoughts, especially when you become emotional in a situation like that and being cognizant and mindful of the fact that you may become emotional, you're getting angry, you're getting irritated, you're getting frustrated, understanding why that is, and then taking the time to understand why the other person is in that state. 
And maybe it's got nothing to do with ill intention. Maybe they're having a bad day. Maybe you've said something that triggered them uh, and they're having flashbacks to something that happened long before they even first met you. Uh, maybe you're talking about something that they're ill-equipped to be discussing in front of a group and they're feeling a bit insecure or vulnerable. There, there's a whole host of reasons they could be responding the way that they are. And by virtue of taking the time to understand where the other person is coming from, you can forge a much stronger connection in that moment and you can resolve conflict much faster. And it's just a lot more constructive and a lot more valuable uh, in terms of the way teams work together, in terms of the way you manage, in terms of the way you do career pathing, in terms of the way you coach. And rather than uh, make the same mistake that I certainly made when I was younger, that a lot of younger, less experienced managers make and just assume everyone should be doing things the way you're doing them, uh, which is, trust me, not the best way to get the most out of another person on your team. You just take the time to understand where they're coming from, what they're trying to accomplish, and do your best to help them make that possible. And then how do you reinforce that down you know, into the organization? What's the muscle memory that you are attempting to build with your leaders and folks around your management team? Yeah, so it, it comes back to something, Tom, that you cited earlier, which is the importance of culture and values. And you know, we delineate between culture and values. We've got uh, five cultural dimensions, six values. One of our values is that relationships matter. It's essentially a proxy for managing compassionately. So it's something we recruit against. It's something we onboard against. It's something we develop against. And it's something we evaluate performance against. And um, one of the things I've learned over the last decade or so where I've been really focused on this, and by the way, I like to talk about aspiring to manage compassionately because it's very, very difficult to be compassionate in all situations at all times. So you have to cut yourself a little bit of slack. Uh, but one of the things I've learned is that uh, we shouldn't wait for people to be in the workforce uh, to be teaching them the importance of compassion and managing compassionately. And that as young as primary school, I think it would be enormously valuable uh, to teach kids what compassion is and the importance of putting yourself in somebody else's shoes. And so one of the things that we're really excited about uh, to talk about tonight is the fact that uh, I'm going to be working with EverFi. And uh, we're going to be rolling out uh, a curriculum uh, for primary schools to begin to teach compassion, hopefully in the 28,000 schools that EverFi reaches. So you want to talk a little bit about what compelled you to get involved? Yeah, it's, uh, this is something that has been uh, just enormously exciting. We probably connected, I don't know, two years ago at this point. And, uh, and it was something, you know, EverFi focuses on these areas that are outside of the core that we feel should be very much a part of the school day, embedded in the school day. So these are areas like healthy relationships, uh, curriculum that goes after bullying, uh, alcohol responsibility, sexual assault prevention, financial literacy, student loan preparation. So these are often areas that have a huge impact on student success. Uh, no one ever uh, spends as much time as they ever should on them. And so we've built this very large school network across the country of millions and millions of students who go through these platforms on, on a daily basis. And, and uh, so the first time I ever sat down with Jeff, uh, he brought this up as, a, um, as something that was very important to him. And we had you know, built 2,000 college campuses to spend a lot of time focusing on college sexual violence and healthy relationships. Um, we had built a really interesting course with the NFL around healthy relationships and embedding that into the school day in high school. But it was very clear that this was something, particularly with what we're seeing so much in society today, that needed to be a part of the school day, particularly in primary school, where we all have kids who are very young, and I have four little kids, and, and Jeff has two. And um, so we started to kick around some ideas, and, and I think Jeff had it on a little longer time, time continuum than I had. Tom is very action-oriented, for those of you in the audience that don't know him personally. <laughs> so um, Jeff said, yeah, we should, um, we should do this. And so I think I called you the next day and said, by the way, we're going to do this. And, um, and uh, so uh, we are knee-deep. My, my partner, Zach Wagner, and, and Tom Parisi, who runs our school network, and others are here. And we're... Um, building out a, a, what's going to be the definitive, fascinating course to 
teach kids the true definition of compassion, uh, to put them in very interesting simulations around um, how they can employ compassion and compassion in their lives with their fellow students, with their teachers, with their families. Uh, there's nothing like it that exists out uh, in the education space today. And um, Jeff has made a, a very big commitment to get behind this personally, to convene uh, not just Silicon Valley, but uh, a lot of folks who have really wanted to see this as a part of the school day in every school in America. And we've made a commitment uh, to begin to roll it out um, late this fall so that every single school in the country will have uh, a compassion curriculum and, and uh, we're gonna work very hard to, to make that happen. So I think it's something that's incredibly important to the country and, uh, and particularly right now and um, something we're really, really proud to be teaming up on. So uh, yeah. Very exciting. Okay. Anything you'd like to, to add to that? No, it's, um, I think you, you said it very well, and uh, I was only half kidding. I mean, when, about Tom being action-oriented, when I first sat down with him, we were talking about education, and one of the reasons we had been introduced is EverFi is doing some amazing stuff in very unorthodox ways that's attracted a lot of attention, and he recently announced uh, major financing that uh, I know we're all very excited about for EverFi. And uh, I've been interested and excited about education reform uh, for as long as I can remember, it was actually one of the reasons I got involved in business, which may sound counterintuitive, but uh, at a fairly young age, I wanted to make a difference in terms of education and decided uh, when I was going to college, I could either pursue a route where I was teaching or administrating or legislating, or I got into business and could amass enough influence and resources, hopefully, to make a difference. And fast forward uh, a couple of decades, and Tom and I are sitting down talking about education reform, and... Um, I was really struck by the model for EverFi, and we got into a discussion about compassion specifically, and the need to teach compassion, and the fact that uh, there's so much focus on truly cognitive skills. You know, you think about the amount of energy and resources that go into math, that go into reading, that go into writing, and if you think about it, what's more important than teaching compassion and so I, I never thought this was something that was going to happen in the immediate future, let alone the foreseeable future. It was kind of a vision to ensure. How many of you are familiar with code.org? Show of hands. So a lot of folks in the audience. So I thought, how cool would it be to essentially do the same for compassion and teaching compassion in schools? And so I threw that out to Tom, not thinking anything of it. And he literally called the next day and said, let's go. And I was like, what do you mean, let's go? Let's go where? And he's like, let's go make this happen. And so sure enough, it's, it's going to happen. Well, I think one of the things that's exciting about what, what Jeff's wanted to do is, is we've been really intentional at EverFi about going to places really where technology is usually the, um, we always say it's the, very much the short end of the stick. Uh, so these are areas in the Alabama Black Belt, Mississippi Delta, lots of Native American reservations across the country. And so I think one of the key things that, that Jeff's made a commitment to do is make sure that, that these programs arrive there and not just in the uh, districts that can afford it. And uh, so one of the things that we've done is um, we've chosen uh, about 10,000 of these schools that are in very, very much um, off the, the beaten path of the usual ed tech cycles and access and, and gonna be bringing the, the compassion curriculum there first. So it's a big focus and um, it'll be many millions of kids in the first year that'll, that'll go through the program. So it's uh, super exciting. So, uh, Very much so. so Gerald, those, if you think about that as a segue into these, um, in the few minutes that we have left here, these non-cognitive skills, um, I would imagine that you have a very interesting balance that you have to um, hold up in terms of uh, the, these softer, you know, what you'd be labeled softer skills that you want to make sure your students, you know, your, your future employees have and, and these hard skills that they're, um, you know, they're often required. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, we, we talk a lot about the ABCs, so attitudinal, behavioral, and communication skills being what we focus on primarily. And most people out there, when you hire, you hire for skills and fire for behavior, right? I mean, for the majority of folks who are not working well in teams, and, you know, James Heckman, who did the seminal research around focusing on early childhood, 
he got up on stage in front of several thousand people and said, I used to think it was actually bad investment to invest in an 18, 20 year old who hasn't kind of made it. And he said, I now realize that you can learn these non-cognitives very quickly. You can model this behavior very quickly. You can actually get uh, into the workforce and do the things employers want. Employers will tell you all day long, find me someone who shows up, is willing to work, is reliable, is a good team player. I will teach them the rest. And I think that shift, especially at that you know, first, second job category, 30 to $50,000 a year jobs, uh, non-cognitives are what employees really are looking for. Uh, and the question is how we're training them. I would argue compassion may not just be for primary school. I know a lot of adults who could use compassion uh, training as well. Um, and I think allowing us to value more than just what's on a resume or just what's in hard skills. In fact, we're just launching through the Ad Council. What we're trying to do is bring this message that young people are uh, much more capable than we may see to many more folks. So three years ago, we launched what has now been an $80 million ad campaign it, through the Ad Council to get employers to see young people actually for who they are, to appreciate that uh, they have a short window of time to get across their competencies. In fact, the average interviewer looks at a resume for seven seconds. The average recruiter looks at a resume for seven oh, seconds. Okay. So we have some new uh, ads that will be going out all across the country, probably another $40, $50 million worth of ads to get employers to see people differently. Um, let's take a look at this. Yeah. Is this the seven second? Is yeah, this? Okay. take a look at this. I worked 12 hour shifts at the recycling company with my dad who's 72. That taught me a work ethic that I carry with me every day. When you're running your own business and taking care of your disabled brother, you tend to learn about responsibility pretty quickly. I was living in a shelter juggling three jobs. I had to be resilient. That's something that you can't teach. Growing up where I did, a lot of things could have gotten in the way of my goals, but I learned to push through. And that's what I bring to work every day. My parents weren't fluent in English. So in school, I had to be independent and take initiative. And that's how I handle every project I get. You know, it's, it's worth mentioning, uh, there's a lot of talk about the importance, obvious importance of diversity, inclusion, belonging, social impact, and it's wonderful to see uh, the extent to which this is becoming part of the dialogue, but this is also about good business. Right. So the, the folks that are coming out of programs like Europe are gonna create a lot of value. And so I think this ad campaign is brilliant because it raises awareness to a talent base that a lot of folks are just not getting exposed to by virtue of some of the inertia and some of those legacy dynamics that we were talking about earlier. So we're all very grateful to Gerald and his vision for having started this 17 years ago. And it's really starting to reach critical mass now, and it's wonderful to see. And how do you, uh, you and I have talked a lot in the past about how you scale this. So talk to me about the next few years and the things you're gonna do to yeah. throw some kerosene on this. As many entrepreneurs, I think, you know, we think about how do you scale, how do you have impact? Um, the challenge we're looking at is measured in six million opportunity youth across this country. Uh, we serve, we've served 17,000, right? So if you think about how small we are. So a lot of our effort today, in fact, that whole Grads of Life platform generated a million people coming to that website, tens of thousands of businesses downloading tools, which we gave and started to create to say, if you want to work with this population, here's how you do it. And we had hundreds and hundreds of businesses call us and say, we think these young people actually are talented. And so we're now working with um, Apple's design firm to take apart what we do programmatically, put a little more technology around it, and figure out how to actually get it into many, many more environments, largely through the community college system, which is 12 million Americans, the largest post-secondary system in the country, I would argue uh, over underutilized in some respects. And how do we get that into millions some of the tenets and principles of things we know how to do that have already helped a lot of people lift themselves out of poverty and into uh, livable wage jobs in this country. So the goal is what's 10x to 100x, which is one of the reasons why working with certainly you and Jeff, you think in those numbers, you work in those numbers, you think about platforms, principles, tools, and so we're trying to shift our gaze and our focus and our altitude to say if it doesn't get you to 10 to 100x, 
uh, we shouldn't be pursuing it with a lot of our capital investments and our innovation investments. That's great. So hopefully we'll get there. But you guys are going to teach me how to do it, hopefully. Well, part of the key is getting the flywheel spinning, right? So one of the things that we're really interested in from LinkedIn's perspective is shining a light on, on these kinds of candidates, these kinds of programs, including uh, facets within our search capability that's going to help hiring managers, it's going to help recruiters uh, find these young adults. And the key is not just finding them. Obviously, that's the, the start of the process and the funnel. But what's really important is that once, say, a year up graduate comes into a company, that they're successful. And with success, the hiring manager and the recruiter says, where do I get more people like that? Right. And that's when you start to get the flywheel spinning, where people st stop the legacy practices, and they stop exclusively recruiting from very specific situations in universities and with very specific, narrow uh, definitions of uh, experience and skills and start broadening that aperture. And when that begins to happen, then you get wholesale change at scale. Yeah. Well, it's kind of fascinating when you think about when we started thinking about doing this together, uh, the pieces that really come together of opportunity youth, how networks can drive opportunity and access for people in a way they never have had before, the way to manage that compassionately, give people opportunities, and, and certainly get your teams to get behind these. It's a, it's a really fascinating ecosystem, and I'm, I'm proud of, uh, certainly proud of what you all are doing. It's a, it's a huge contribution to, to the country. And um, thank you all for staying so late tonight. Uh, it's great. Thanks so much. Everybody. One more round, please. Uh, yes, the program starts tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. We'll see you all then. You get back from the tabernacle. Bye then. Thanks. Great. There's a fire starting in my heart, reaching a fever pitch, and it's bringing me out the dark. Finally, I can see you crystal clear.